Okay, I think we have a ro roving microphone. If anybody has any questions, right up here in front. She's coming. If you give your name and uh, who you're addressing the question to. I'm Jerry Rawls from Los Altos, California. Um, and, and, and my question is for Greg. You mentioned the concept of negative pricing on the part of ERCOT, and how in the world, and you said, and they make money from it sometimes. It. I don't understand negative pricing and... Are you on? I don't know if you hear me. We got it? Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting, uh, interesting concept. What, uh, what the situation is, is you have day ahead bidding and you have nodal pricing. So what happens is they, they project a amount of power that you need, and then what you have is a clearing price, which equals the lowest uh, uh, bid for that cumulative amount of power. So they can bid negative pricing, which pushes the power into the market, but it doesn't necessarily give them negative pricing. Now, if the pricing does go low between the, the production tax credits and the carbon, uh, the carbon uh, uh, offsets that, that they have. They, they, can, they can pretty much break even. The Texas Public Policy Foundation has said that you, you can pretty much uh, break even on an on a operating cost uh, basis. But no, they, they literally don't get negative pricing. They get a clearing pricing, which equals the lowest bid for the other competitors the, to equal the total. You, you understand what I'm talking about? See, the way I understand there that is, if that clearing price for that period of time, let's say we need um, 50 gigawatts. Right. Uh, wind is only at 30 gigawatts. But they can bid negative, and other people have to step in to make up the difference. Right. And so they'll bid for the other 20 gigawatts that, that's needed, most coal, natural gas, and nuclear is the baseline. It's going to be there, and the price ends up at, let's say, 15 cents. Everybody gets 15 cents, even the people that bid negative. But the wind people bring the, di the, uh, the price down so that the other people can no longer afford it. Coal people can't afford it. Yeah. Is that clear as mud? Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. There's why right in the middle. Okay, that one right here. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm Tom Sheehan from the uh, Science Environmental Policy Project. Back in 1989, I got a tour by Chuck Till of the Integral Fast Reactor in Idaho. In those days, it was run by Argonne, and subsequently, it's become the Idaho National Engineering Lab. But at the time, uh, it was a sodium-cooled reactor. It was a uh, um, making, you know, um, which I say reprocessing. The the, uh, the spent fuel rods were taken down in the basement by robots, and new fuel rods were put together, and so forth. It was a wonderful device, and. It seemed to be the really wave of the future in uh, the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And I wonder what became of it, because I'm hearing about sodium-cooled reactors now and all these new features, um, fast breeder, etc. That was all there 30 years ago, and somehow it vanished. Uh, that's, that's an excellent question. Uh, in fact, it was something I had cut out of the talk that I, because I was running out of time. Uh, one of the problems that we have with the national labs is they have the, pro the propensity to do research for research's sake. And they're not good at translating technology and designs into a marketable product to productize it. And so they have a lot of these test reactors, have been a number of them throughout the years. And you're absolutely right, it's a, it's a very good design. But unless a company is willing to invest into com commercializing it, unless you can get the, the utilities to buy off on it, there is a reluctance to take it to, to the next step. And the national labs are not terribly good at that. As I said, they kind of do research for research's sake so they can get the next tranche of funding for the next year. And so they tend to look fairly short-sighted on some of these test, test projects that unfortunately never get off either the test platform or the drawing board. But, uh, but I wish they did or they could. And that's kind of what 
when I mentioned this next Manhattan Project effort, it's going to take industry, government, and the utilities working together on doing the initial design work, doing the testing, getting it in a manufacturable fashion, and also have it so that private in industry can build it and get a return on investment on it, and the utilities can make money on it. Utilities are in the commodity business, and they work on cents on the dollar. And so when you have a large investment like a nuclear reactor uh, that has a high capital expense, it has to be sized correctly. All the technologies have to be developed, approved by the NRC, and put into place. And I think that's the real challenge we have going forward. Does that address your question, sir? Thank you. This one right over there. Hi, my name is Bob Enlick from uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Back in the 70s, there was this Clinch River breeder reactor. And the idea is that we could use a reactor to generate more usable nuclear fuel so that we would never run out. Could you review, review for us why that failed and why the French were able to succeed? Hmm. I'm not sure why it failed. Uh, part of the concern with breeder reactors is that they have the ability to uh, make we weapons grade plut plutonium. The French have been doing recycling of fuel as well as looking into fast breeders. And the, the uh, I don't have a full answer on that in terms of the uh, Clinch River breeder except that they, they did get it to work and a lot of it is being used now by other companies that are looking at fast breeder reactors, particularly the ones that are in the competition right now, and applying that, that te technology. But that's as far as I know about it, sir. And there's one back over here. Oh. This side has no questions. It's all yeah. right. Except for Willie. Uh -huh. um, my name's TJ. I'm from rural Texas. Um, as kind of the, the token warmest in the room, there's a lot of things that I think about when I go to these. But uh, recently, actually the last couple of years, Rand Corporation, which is a think tank out in Santa Monica, California, started this program called Combating Truth Decay. And it's an interesting uh, concept, look it up if you want to, but in their library videos, they have a video from uh, Soledad O'Brien. And she says that for her purposes, she doesn't want to bore the, the populace with facts, she just wants to tell the story. And that may, say, that may seem counterproductive to the idea of combating truth decay, but it recognizes the real point of human behaviors where we want a story, we don't, we don't want a table of numbers. And I think that narrative is very well understood from the warmest side that I have. Um, if you ask any 11-year-old, they can give you some quick story of what global warming means, what climate change means. But after attending four of these conferences, I still can't put together in my mind what is the central point that you're trying to make. What is the narrative? And the last speaker was talking about trying to find a spokesman. I think you need to nail down your narrative first before you do that. So I'm just wondering, between the panel, can you all come up with a coherent theme for these last 14 years of uh, climate change things? That's my question. I, I couldn't understand the question. Yeah. Was, was there a question in that? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you 100%. I think uh, in several of my experiences in life, I've gone, fallen into the engineering trap of giving the logic and the path and the path to completion, et cetera, et cetera. And somebody told me one time, and I think it makes a lot of sense, forget all that logic, Tom, you need a theme song and a slogan. And I think that that's probably what we need. We need some little short statement that people can, can remember 
And uh, I think all the logic and things and facts would, would support that, but you can't, you can't present all that stuff. That's, that's the, I have the same problem as you do. There's a lot of good stuff here. I don't know how you get all this stuff together and give it to somebody that's a layman and understands and how to act on it, especially a politician, elected official. Yeah. If I could add, add one point, I think that the, the 30 topic uh, booklet that Heartland is putting out to schools and other things is a very good first step to at least consolidate the data and that that is, is at least a starting point. And where it goes from there, right. <laughs> it takes a theme song and a, someone to promote it. Yeah. From my uh, perspective, I, I think you're, you're uh, spot on in one area. The climate change, I have, after four or five years of working on this, uh, climate change to me is about a 95, it's a narrative. It's not science. It's about 5% science, about 95% of a lot of gobbledygook. And uh, the, the narrative is what people push. And I've often thought to myself, well, maybe there needs to be a counter narrative. But, you know, when I talk to my uh, associates on this, they always say, well, you can't fight, you know, uh, you got to fight this with scientific facts and truth. But it's hard from something that's been so propagandized to stick to the facts. A lot of people do not, not want to hear the facts. Uh, you know, in, in reality, what I, I think, there's a significant possibility that uh, that uh, the, the natural causes dominate. I think Willie's going to tell us a little bit about that, but but that's uh, uh, I haven't drawn my own firm conclusions, but I, I think that's really uh, the bulk of what's going on now. If we gave that a little more uh, um, uh, publicity or the like, it, it might it might help. But uh, yeah, I think we've been too defensive in, in nature. I think we're um, out of time. Um, I appreciate it. And thank everybody for, for coming. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you.